Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this online short course, Mind Your Head, which will be all about uh, how to take care of your mental well-being in academia. I'm uh, Eleanor van Reisinger and I'm a postdoc at uh, École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, I have been involved within mental health um, since a few years when I uh, decided to start writing this blog series, Mind Your Head, together with Anne. And um, yeah, since that we've been working on that and um, uh, we thought to take it to the next level and to continue this dialogue about mental health. So that's why uh, we decided to organize this short course. Um, and we decided to organize this short course around uh, mental health because we believe it's a very important topic in academia that deserves more attention. There's more and more research showing that many people in academia have problems, have uh, uh, suffer from mental health issues. Um, this can be anxiety or depression or emotional exhaustion. And it even seems that such problems are much more common in academia than in other disciplines. So for this webinar today, we invited five panelists who will give short talks about different topics within the uh, overall theme of mental health. They will introduce different types of mental health issues, share their own experiences, or um, um, give you advice on how you can take care of your own mental well-being. So in the end, uh, we will also take some time to discuss the current corona crisis and how it impacts your mental health, but mainly give you advice on how you can uh, manage yourself better in these uh, strange but challenging times. Um, so before we start, I would like to introduce all of our speakers. First, we have Anna Blymakers, who is an assistant professor at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, Anna has been actively involved in writing the EGU blog series, Mind Your Head, which was one of the inspirations for this short course. Um, she recently wrote a blog post about how to um, manage yourself during this uh, corona crisis, so that's definitely worth checking out. Um, then we have Christopher Jackson, who is a professor at Imperial College in London. Uh, he's a great advocate for early career scientists, and he's a champion of open and inclusive research environment. Chris dealt with depression during his PhD, and he hopes that sharing his own experiences will uh, make it easier for other people to reach out. Our third speaker is Mike Ungovino Safely Zimts, um, who is a lecturer in research and development at the University of the West of Scotland. Um, Safely has been involved in the EDU both as a division and union wide uh, representative for early career scientists. And she's also been involved in organizing the ECS Great Debate last year, which was all around um, mental health issues as well. Uh, she was diagnosed a few years ago with MS, uh, which made it extra challenging for her to take care of herself. Um, she's a great advocate for uh, academics uh, with uh, chronic illness, and she will talk more about that later during her own talk. Then we have Jean Holloway, who is a PhD candidate at um, the University of Ottawa in Canada. So good morning, Jean, because for her it's early morning. Um, she was recently interviewed by the Cries for a Division blog around uh, mental health, where she openly shares her own experiences and advice around mental health. Um, by uh, talking about her personal journey, she hopes that she can inspire others to uh, learn more about how to take care of their own mental health. And then finally, we invited Yuri Tiding to join us. Uh, Yuri is a psychiatrist and researcher at the VU Medical Center in Amsterdam. So he basically studies researchers, so he might be able to give us a slightly different perspective on all this. He also wrote uh, a book, which is called Scientists on the Sofa, in which he gives you advice on how you can uh, deal with certain problems within the uh, academic working environment. Um, it now only exists in Dutch, but it will be available in English soon as well. So those are all the speakers that we will have today. Um, I'm really happy that you all can join us today, um, and I look forward to hearing all of your talks. So before we start, I would like to give a final remark about this webinar. We're not live, but you can still ask questions and co uh, give comments either on one of the specific talks or in general, and you can do that by typing them in the comments section below, and then we'll do our best to get back to you uh, about that. So the first talk is by Anna Blymakers, and she will talk about the imposter syndrome and the feeling of I'm not good enough. Oh, I need to share my screen. Okay. <laughs> the reason why I want to talk about this is um, because it's something that I see a lot around me and that I suffer from in more or less uh, measure depending on uh, other circumstances. And I think especially in academia, the imposter syndrome is easy. It's something that easily takes root because we quantify ourselves usually with numbers. So these are my numbers in the scientific way. 2015 was the year that I defended my PhD. At the moment, I have published or co-published 14 papers. I have a 
nine on the Google Scholar Age Index, the holy grail of the scientists. I have obtained several uh, grants, including a very prestigious one in the Netherlands from the Dutch Science Foundation. And um, I captured a unicorn quite recently. On February 1st this year, I became a tenure track assistant professor at TU Delft. So generally speaking in academia, I should know that I am somehow good enough. I think these numbers do not tell the entire story. If I would choose numbers myself to uh, present myself, I would go for these numbers. Um, two is the ideal number of espressos in a day. I would say that one is the ideal one time a week, is the ideal amount of sports per week. At the moment, I'm on a strict corona regime and I send myself out for a walk every day. Um, and I bake in an average week one sourdough bread, uh, but in these coroning, corona times, it's maybe three or four breads just to keep busy. And I travel a lot. I have a long distance relationship and I am uh, in academia and I fly around the world and around Europe. Um, and last year I made at least 15, if not more flights. And I enjoy travel a lot, even though uh, in this day and age, you can wonder if you should travel this much. Still, despite all this, despite theoretically being accomplished, I still think thoughts along these lines regularly. I am not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not efficient enough. Others are better than me. And I'm by far not the only one who thinks thoughts like this. So um, if this were a real life session, I would say raise your hand if you think any of these things or something similar like this very often. And I would say that I do think this. So this is known as the imposter syndrome. It got uh, published as first as a term in 1987, I think. And it's something that gets worse under stress. So Corona times, of course, is a time that it's under stress. And you could even wonder, am I managing the Corona times good enough? Um, other moment, moments, it gets worse. Uh, job interviews, the first time, the first day, the first week or months on a new job during networking events, so uh, conferences such as EGU would have been this year, maybe online it's easier or even it becomes for some people more difficult because you have less information. And also when you reach a milestone, so for speaking for myself is uh, the moment I got a prestigious grant, instead of feeling this as a confirmation it's good enough, it actually felt as the moment that I had to start to prove myself. Also when getting my unicorn, when getting my tenure track position, you actually uh, run the risk of having the feeling that then you need to start working, whereas actually that's of course not the case. Um, studies show that there's two types of responses to stress situations, the fight or flight response. So in academia, you could say that the fight response is that you work harder, you work longer hours, you work more and more and more with any potential dangers um, after that. The flight response is that you don't even start doing what you want to do or when you do and you actually succeed at them, that you trivialize them or even that you manage the situation such that you don't need to start and you sabotage yourself and you don't get where you actually want to go. So ways to basically do internal self-management and um, things that uh, help me and others around me. Uh, I call it know your internal asshole. Like, your brain can be really mean. Um, you know the ways in which your brain is mean. So when your brain is being mean to you, you just think, okay, it's just my brain. It will be better another day. You're not the only one who thinks things like this. So if you talk about it, you find out that one, it's quite normal to not always feel as if you're great. And two, um, you might not be right. You are actually a great person. Not everything that you think is necessarily true. So uh, it could be that you think you can see into the future. So uh, if A happens, then B must happen. That's not necessarily true. Or um, that you think that you know what other people are thinking, which you do not unless they tell you. Um, and other tricks like that. 
something someone reminded me recently of is that it's important to not compare yourself to others. Every single one of us is unique. We all have our own qualities and it's very easy to see what other people are good at and to forget what you yourself are good at. We are all different. We are not one alike and there's also not one person that is the right kind of person to be. We are all unique. We are all good enough. Some days it really doesn't work out. Some days you're just in a funk. Well, that's also okay. On those days, just try and relax. Just deal with it as well as you can. And then tomorrow is a new day, a better day. You can just start over, try again. And one thing that I think is very important with any of these kind of things, you can get a long way with internal self-management, but if it really doesn't work out, you should not be ashamed to find professional help when you need it. I mean, when you break your leg, you also don't self-manage it and hope it will go away. So that is my talk and maybe it helps you. I hope so. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Anne. I recognize a lot of the things you say. Um, I was, I was, I was looking at these scientific numbers that you were, you were showing in the beginning. And personally, if I look at numbers like that, I immediately get insecure because I start comparing myself. Um, they are designed like that. Um, so, um, uh, do you think we should completely move away from using these type of numbers to, uh, to show ourselves in academic environment? Or do you think we should just try to look at them differently and just not take them as, as directly as they are? Uh, I don't think you can get out of moving away from them completely. Um, I do really like at the moment the Dutch governments and the Dutch uh, funding institutions are moving away from things like impact factors of journals or the age index and they're more going towards uh, individual uh, so if an individual paper made an impact, for example, because it was cited somewhere, but also maybe because it was blogged about, or maybe because it was posted and reposted and reposted on social media. So they're taking a broader view towards uh, criteria of success than, uh, than is traditional at the moment. And I think that's a very good way. I do think that, I mean, it is still a way of quantifying. So I personally don't think we will move away from it completely, nor do I think we should. And there, there's a lot of research going on at the moment to improve those uh, criteria. We, we, there's, a, there's this, for example, the Hong Kong Manifesto is really an add-on here. It's, very re, re, it's really refreshing to read about other criteria that we can use about very important skills, academic skills that needs to be assessed. And, 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 and are relatively easy to quantify. So uh, the Dutch are, are taking the lead in this. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to our next talk, which will be by Christopher Jackson. And he's gonna talk about the importance of physical activity uh, during stressful periods. Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Chris Jackson. I'm at Imperial College. I'm a professor of base analysis. So I'm a geoscientist. And um, I entitled my talk, Move Your Body, um, because um, I guess there's a disclaimer at the start of this talk is that I'm um, a geoscientist. I'm interested in base analysis, volcanoes being one of those things, earthquakes, uh, landscape evolution. And I'm not actually Mo Farah, the um, British long distance Olympic athlete, right? So I am a geologist and I'm not a professional athlete, <laughs> but... I'm very passionate about physical activity, but nothing I'm gonna say in the next few minutes is really qualified by the fact I have a degree in sports psychology or a degree in physical education or any of those things. This is a very personal view um, based largely around the, the activity I like most running around why I value it and why I think it's a really valuable thing, especially for academics and especially in the present uh, coronavirus times we find ourselves. So I'm not him. So growing up, I was kind of a small child, and this is me, um, the age of about two. Uh, I was a very active child anyway. Uh, if I speak to my mum and dad, I was always running around and uh, I was very physically active growing up. So this is a bit about the history as to why I am like I am today. And I played sport all the time, all the time. Like five times a week I was playing sport. I was either playing football, and um, I played to a fairly decent standard for my, my town and my county. Um, or I was always doing athletics as well. So for me, even 
when looking back now, even as a small child who was kind of, you know, academically okay, but not one of the most gifted kids in class, I needed that release. I needed to be moving my body as well as I was kind of working my mind in class. So there was this kind of very opposite experience I was having by doing two different things. You know, these are very different things. One, athletics is a very individual pursuit, as is running, like I'll talk about in a moment. But football is a very team-based, you know, activity. It's very physical, but it brings a very different set of um, experiences to you that you don't get from doing an individual pursuit like running. And that's what I'm kind of going to focus on now, the thing I like doing most, which is uh, running. So why is it important uh, for me as an academic? Well, as an academic, um, we spend, we often have a lot of balls in the air, right? And there's a lot of ways like Anna spoke about of measuring ourselves and worrying and stress and strain and, and just being generally concerned about our performance. What I really like about running is it allows us to step outside of that very claustrophobic space we often find ourselves in. And have a very different experience. So for me, the way I always describe this to people is running, I have two different responses when I'm running. One is I'm thinking of a hard scientific problem and I can't get my hand and my head around it until I start running. And while I'm running, there's, my body's aching, but I'm allowed to think. You know, my mind at that point can be doing some work and some hard work on a bit of science. The other extreme is I've had a scientific problem that's been bothering me so much I can't sleep and it's bothering me and it's eating away at me and it's all the things Anna referred to that eventually kind of grind you down. But then when I go running, I can't hold a thought. It's really nice, I can hear the birds, I can see the people, I can feel the wind. I have a very different response at those times. So running, I'm never sure which of those two responses I'm gonna have, but I value both of those responses when I'm out running. The other reason for me I find running a very beneficial activity is because physically feeling good then mentally I feel able to kind of to work as well so I actually um, if I'm feeling physically well myself um, you know and, and, and weight loss is one vanishing for me is one vanishingly small part of exercise it's kind of you know most of it is about how you feel about yourself and how you view yourself but for me feeling fit and strong and active is a really important part of my mental well-being so I get a, I draw a lot of positivity from and the act of physical exercise. And this is why I often preach quite almost religiously about how valuable it is, because people don't, they seem to view it often as purely a, um, a physical activity and engagement, whereas there's a lot of mental benefits to be had from exercising. And so coming through to what, you know, what is it like now? And I don't know if anybody out there uses Strava and like measures like how far they run, how fast they run, and just keep a, a fitness log really. So, you know, we've, we've got to flatten the curve. But for somebody who's physically very active, one concern was maintaining your curve. Okay, and what I'm showing here, uh, two curves. One is from March, uh, and the orange, well, the grey one's from March, and the orange one is from April. So the, the orange dot at the top is, is this morning. Um, and, you know, I just want to talk through these graphs to show you how I've tried to engage in my physical activity for all the benefits I've just outlined during the coronavirus. So that's my background trajectory there at the beginning of March. It's quite a gentle trajectory. I've left, the, you know, I've left the scales off here because I think that, you know, how far we do things, how fast we do things and not why we do it. This was a race I did. I did a half marathon. So you can see a steepening there and I did a few intense sessions just before. I then had my post-race blues where I eat cake and watch TV and drink beer and sit on the sofa because, you know, as, as cool as exercising is, you need to let your body recover as you need to let your mind recover as well when you've really worked that hard. And then lockdown happened. <laughs> and for me, the, the, the response was shown there. You can see that trajectory significantly steepens um, from the background. And you can see as you go through April, if anything, there's bits of that early part of April curve where the, the, the curve is steeper than it's ever been. And so for me, one way of really partly separating work and home life was to actually kind of do these false commutes people are doing. So actually to do some exercise in the morning to get the heart rate up, to add a little bit of distance between home and work or the virtual work, which is actually in my daughter's bedroom at the moment, <laughs> but just to make it feel like I had some movement in my day and to get me and to give me some a bit of a workout. So that was kind of me maintaining my curve. But I thought these graphics and the analytics behind this, I'd really love to go to all of the academics who were very physical active and see what their curves looked like as they entered lockdown. 
And just now to finish, I just want to talk a bit about like, you know, why people should get into running and what maybe stops them doing any sort of physical activity as academics. One is we're just really busy. Often we're just too busy to exercise and that then has a double effect, right? Because we're physically allowing ourselves maybe not to feel as great as we could because we're mentally being challenged all the time at work and we feel angst around that. And these sorts of images here don't help either. A lot of people who don't do running or don't do any physical activity probably have these images in their mind of the uber ultra athletes. And everybody thinks, well, if I'm not gonna be like that or have the runner's brain or not make the front cover of the, the frontier runners, like what's the point of engaging in that? But in reality, exercise and running is this, you know, this is, this, this is like I've done nine marathons and 35 half marathons now. And all the people I see in the waiting area and on the race look like this, a broad cross section of people, different shapes, sizes, ages, um, genders, everything. And it's, and it's a wonderful thing. And, and there's so much humanity as well as the physicality in exercise. You get to meet amazing people and see them doing unbelievable things. And, and if you didn't need that before coronavirus, you probably want it now, right? <laughs> I think it's a really great thing to, to be able to go out. And you see it in my local park, lots of people exercising it's it's bursting at the seams now with exercises people running and that's a problem in itself but it shows the value people probably innately had in them you know the importance exercise had for them that they weren't able to utilize until a global pandemic so just to finish if you're interested you know like and i want to get into this what should you be listening for just get started you know trying to think about why you want to exercise um make sure your progress is slow often people say i want to run and they go out and try and run a marathon in the afternoon and it's not gonna happen, it's physically impossible. Think about easing into it with things like the run-walk method. And I'm talking about running here, but I've got one final slide about that. But you know, there's lots of ways of just getting you off the sofa by walking briskly for 30 seconds and walking slowly for 30 seconds and walking briskly for 30 seconds again and so on. And you will be surprised at how I've seen people build through very low level engagement at the start to be engaged fully with running. Don't get discouraged, it's always hard, even if you're starting out, but even if you're an experienced runner like me, there are times when you feel just not your best. Explore new places, it's a really great way to, um, to look around and at conferences, academic conferences, is where I take my running shoes as the first things I pack, is so I can go and explore cities and look around under my own steam. And then a proper technique is one thing, this runner's world sort of guidance is, and I've left the hyperlink at the bottom of the slide there. What happens if you don't like running? <laughs> Because a lot of people just say, I, don't, I can't run, I don't run, I've never been able to run, or some combination thereof. There are lots of other ways of moving your body. Cycling, and you can do cycling as a lone engagement as well. If you don't like being around people on the start line or running in a city, you can ride in isolation. And that is, you probably don't want to be in isolation too much at the moment, I'm not sure. But um, it is a really great thing to do. Swimming as well, if you don't feel like your joints, you know, people have knee and, and existing um, injuries that stop them from exercising, um, this is another opportunity. And then there's also sports where you engage with other people, either at a you know, one-to-one level, like racket sports, or where you engage in running clubs as well, where there'd be a number of people. My final comment is just to say, a lot of what I'm talking about here is things which are, uh, which are more readily available to people who are able to go out and do these sorts of forms of exercise. So the question for our community is, or for anybody who likes exercising, how do people who can't do these things physically engage as well in activities? And I know some people are on this uh, webinar now who have very good views on that and have a lot more experience because I'm able-bodied, you know, I, I have absolutely no sort of impairment apart from being asthmatic. So I'd be interested to learn about how I could communicate this message to those people as well. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I don't know in the UK, but in Paris, they actually forbid running during the day because there are so many people running that now you can only run uh, in the early morning or the evening. Um, is there anyone who has a question or a comment about Chris's talk? I just wanted to comment on um, obviously the last point um, Chris made around, you know, what if you can't run for, you know, or leave your house or for whatever reason. There are um, there's a big movement at the moment around kind of chair exercises, so um, especially the MS society, so like chair yoga or chair pilates, so um, which you could do, you know, from a wheelchair as well, for example. And one of my friends um, actually started using a hand bike, 
So she has a, um, a hand bike at home and it's just really about getting your heart rate up for the kind of cardio um, fitness. So I think it's with the same as like technology helping us, you know, connect in ways there's more and more things actually kind of coming out that make um, exercise um, more available at home. And one of the things, for example, I got recently is a turbo trainer so I can have the bike um, at home since we're only allowed out for one hour. Um, we kind of set that up in the house. So my question would be, uh, how do you motivate yourself to go out at the end of the day on a day that it's rainy, windy, <laughs> tired, you don't want to, do you have any tips or tricks for that? How do you convince yourself to go out when you're kind of not in the mood? I don't. <laughs> 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 I'm, you know like even physical exercise obsessive like me there are days like that right you can't you can't make it work you can't lift yourself off the sofa or drag yourself away from the tv you, you know the, the, the you know the kid is ill or you know your child's ill or there's some moving part in your life which means you can't do it and you can't like you said you can't beat yourself up about the times you aren't going you can only fully engage in the times you can so there are times, and what I, what I, so yeah, there's no um, silver bullet to this. There's no magic answer to how to get yourself off the couch. Sometimes you just need to stay on the couch. What I would say, absolutely, the times I have forced myself to go outside when it's rainy and cold and I'm feeling exhausted, I have never been on a run where I have not then felt better after making that leap out of the door. I can honestly 100% say that. But even having said that, when I'm sitting on the sofa, I'm thinking, I know if I go for this run, it's going to be great for me. I just won't go. I'll just like open a beer and sit on the couch because you can't, you, you know, you just, life is hard sometimes. I think I have the same what you have with running, but then with just walking. Yeah, yeah, what it, whatever it is, whatever it is, like walking, cycling, swimming, you know, whatever it is people have that is a, is a, is a, is a welcome distraction and a valuable distraction from academia which is principally around the application of the mind with some application of personality as well hopefully and some you know humility and humanity right because <laughs> we know the people who just apply their minds what they may be like um but yeah anything that gets you out like steph says you know whatever it is getting your heart rate up physically feeling better about yourself you know you can do light, low heart rate low heart rate activities are also valuable um but yeah, it's, it's awesome. I do a lot of yoga and actually what the teachers usually say is the hardest thing is to arrive on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the hard part, which is absolutely true because it means the same. Afterwards, you always feel amazing. And uh, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the next talk, which is by Stephanie. Uh, she talks about how to adjust to academic life uh, living with a chronic illness. I'm Stephanie. Um, as you can see, I'm no longer in, um, res uh, in geoscience. I changed careers to research and development, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this talk as well. Um, as Eleanor already said, I was diagnosed with MS, and I'm going to tell you in the next kind of slide when that happened and what that was like. Um, before I start, though, and I know some people have that done already, so here's my disclaimer. Um, I'm sharing my personal lived experience and especially for talks like this, I think it's really important that any lived experience is valuable and is real. So there's no kind of right or wrong. If this has happened to you, this is what happened to you. Um, these are my opinions and my views. Um, and with a lot of other things, this is a never ending learning curve. So there might be things I might be getting wrong. Um, I'm here to learn about that as well, not just about myself, but also about um, others, mental health in general. Um, and how other people deal with um, all sorts of aspects around mental well-being. So here are my um, academic uh, stops, as you can see, um, started out with a kind of geoscience. I um, also um, worked for the British Geological Survey after my PhD. I did some postdocs um, at Heritage Watt. And then, as you can see there at the end of 2018, I decided to change careers. And this was partly, but not mainly, due to the fact that um, during my second postdoc at Harriet Watt, um, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And looking back, actually, the diagnosis was tough, but actually the 10 months leading up to getting diagnosed, um, looking back, I probably should have gotten help at that time. And some of the things that kind of resonate with me with the imposter syndrome that Anne talked about is the 
I just didn't feel ill enough to go and get help because I was just like, um, at the time also, I don't think I recognized that I was probably in some sort of kind of high functioning depression. Um, and hindsight, obviously, as with a lot of these things, um, I'm now a, a lot better at kind of maybe recognizing some of these things and getting help a bit quicker. Um, but I did get help kind of once I had the, the diagnosis, even though that was tricky um, as well. I'm going to share that in the next couple of slides. Um, the first thing after diagnosis and kind of a little bit before that was the there's this new uncertainty. So as a postdoc, so kind of career-wise, there was this uncertainty around fixed term contracts. And now I had this new un uncertainty added to it. So what was life going to be like, um, especially with kind of MS, it's um, it could go in so many different ways and you just really don't know and the research isn't really there to help you predict your outcome. Um, how will I going to manage, especially in kind of academia, high pressure environments, you know, is that already stressful environments? And then this kind of added uncertainty with fixed term contracts, you know, will I get hired? How will other people see me? What impact will this have? And as you can see, by well, there's just so many questions and it basically just felt like I was maybe towards the end of like a, a thousand piece um, puzzle when someone flipped the table and I just had to kind of look at everything again um, and trying to sort kind of all of these different pieces out. So the way I kind of coped and that might not be the best way of, of coping was that the researcher inside me took over and I started reading a lot pretty much everything I could find about multiple sclerosis, all the research papers. So the advantage of being a researcher was I had access to a lot of the actual research papers um, and wasn't just relying on kind of blog posts. And I also made a plan. So I like planning. Um, I'm an African bullet journal person. Um, I just like having things written down. And I actually started my bullet journal um, in the time when I was going through the diagnosis phase, because that's one of the things that helped me kind of um, clear my mind and I've been journaling since so coming up to four years and um, that all kind of worked until I hit this um, brick wall and it really kind of felt like that and it was about three months after my diagnosis where I had a great day out in the field we did this amazing field trip and I just overdid it I absolutely exhausted myself and I had for the first time ever um, fatigue like really but I couldn't get out of bed for three days um, and that for me was the first time I realized that life won't be the same because up until that point it kind of didn't feel that different um, but that was the first time I'm like okay crap like I can't I can't keep going on like that um, and that's when I actually reached out um, for help and as I said already I probably should have done that a bit sooner but I just didn't feel like um, I was deserving of it or I wasn't really ill enough to kind of get help um, which looking back um, yeah it was just silly but at the time that's just how it felt um, so I did get help um, in different ways and one of the things um, I did get was um, counseling and I had six sessions that were provided actually through my employer and one of the things I would say is find out now what is available for when you need it I had no idea we had this access. I did not know the difference between access for staff and students, for example. So I actually ended up going to student services because I didn't know where to go um, for help. And the first time help was offered to me was when I actually told the university about my diagnosis. Um, they were really bad in kind of communicating what is available. I know since that has happened to me, I've been kind of pushing for that to change. Um, and they have been a lot better about kind of making links more available and just being a bit more open about the help that is available. I also found some other helpful support groups and the, the best one I can recommend um, for anyone going through, you know, chronic illness, disability is chronically academic. They're um, a peer run group. They have um, a really good Facebook group. Um, they're so supportive. And in the UK, they are also now trying to associate with another disabled staff group um, which is just fantastic um, and they're just really open and welcoming. I also started engaging with the MS community and the other disabled communities um, through social media, 
um, or some um, some of the community groups also have like a forum where you can engage um, online and that has been really helpful just to say Anne said it's ready just talking to someone who then just and they say yes I know what you're talking about it makes all the difference um, which is why I kind of quite early on decided that I'm just going to be open about my diagnosis. I'm also always happy to, you know, answer questions around it. I really don't mind. It's like on my, you know, my social media profile is kind of, I don't want to say full with it, but you know, I, I am quite open about my life um, with MS. Um, I'm advocating for change. As I said already, the university was quite poor in kind of accommodating or providing support or actually advertising support that was available. So I uh, basically told them that, that I don't think that was good enough and I for example one of the things I um, arranged was a talk from HR to the postdoc community about the help that they could get if they ever needed it um, and these are kind of some of the things I've been trying to kind of keep going um, ever since. The other thing um, I did was actually I reflected on my priorities um, and that was things around am I really where I want to be? Is this the career I really want to do? Is this actually the job I want to do going forward? And with some other things that had happened um, and some of the um, things I got involved with at university, I decided that geoscience wasn't really the right path for me anymore. And that's how I ended up in research and development. Um, I've been in that post for 16 months now, I think. And it was one of the best decisions I've made. I absolutely um, love my new role and it's been really 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 great. So the lessons I am still learning um, is that um, you can be active in the MS community, um, you know you can help others. Um, MS is not my life, it is a big part of it. Some days it's a bigger part than others to a point where I, I sometimes, it's not that I forget that I have MS but it's just not in the forefront. Um, and other days, you know, if I wake up and I can't even get out of bed, obviously, then that day it is kind of my life. But um, as was said as well, you know, tomorrow is another day and you might be able to make it onto the sofa. I'm an, a runner and actually the my MS diagnosis got me back into running and um, kind of the motivation to try and stay active. And my running club um, I joined has been really great. And I like that there I'm kind of known first as a runner and then as a runner with MS. And the, they actually been have, they've been really great um, at the kind of in the current situation. We now have a, like a WhatsApp group and we started doing virtual club nights where someone basically shares some of their running experiences. So I, me and another runner from the group who also has MS are going to talk on Tuesday um, about what that's like. Um, and I think that's really, really great that they're engaging. Um, I made the reflection kind of part now of my practice. So I try every six to 12 months kind of to look back and see if, you know, the things I've done in the past and um, just kind of using hindsight a little bit to help me plan a little bit better. And one of the things, for example, was the actually finding out what are my kind of points when I where I should be getting help and kind of learning a little bit about what are kind of my triggers um, as well. And with that comes that it's a never ending learning curve. Um, the, my MS is, um, is called relapsing remitting. So I do, I might have a relapse at some point. I don't really know when uh, and what that will be like. So um, I'll just kind of have to learn kind of how to adjust. So some of the things I had learned already because of my diagnosis have been kind of handy right now, adjusting to this new life. So this new uncertainty, I already dealt with that before. So this just kind of felt like putting some of those things into practice. Um, and with that, for me, uh, self-care has been quite important. And this idea that so self-care is not selfish. You need to be, you know, looking after yourself um, so you can do your job well, you know, and you can look after others. Um, and with that, um, also to be kind and not just to others, but also be kind to yourself. And sometimes it's really good to actually think about how, if this was, if this were my friend, how would I talk to them about it? And then you do that to yourself. Um, and I think that is kind of the key, especially right now, is that like, don't be too hard um, on yourself, as the previous speakers have said already. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I was I was wondering, like, um, it's it's difficult for people who don't know you to see that uh, you might uh, need to take better care of yourself. Um, so, do you 
tell people a lot about uh, having been diagnosed with MS or do you only occasionally mention it? Because I can imagine that sometimes you make choices um, that personally I would, I would feel um, that other people might think I'm lazy or I'm leaving early because you know I want to take care of myself. Um, do, do these thoughts pop, in, pop up in your mind and do you, do you, does it make you tell people well maybe you don't want to tell them? So um, actually, yeah, it's quite interesting, especially with the lazy part. So that was for me was one of the reasons actually why I opened up about having MS quite early and like told work because I was really worried that someone would be like, oh, Steph's leaving at two o'clock again. Like, you know, look at that, like slacker. Um, the, um, the bringing it up is a bit, so it's on, for example, on my social media profile on Twitter, it's in my, it's in my bio, for example. Um, if I were to meet someone, I probably wouldn't be starting with, hey, I'm Steph and I have MS. But if at some point something were to come up, so um, for example, if I needed to, you know, to leave or someone were to ask something, or for example, I have to take medication quite regularly, um, that would sometimes be, you know, people might ask for like, what's that for? The other one I have is I use, uh, and I've been using that at the General Assembly, um, for example, is the please offer me a seat badge, which I wear. Um, I normally have it on my lanyard. And um, so this year, actually, if it would have happened in Vienna, they would have been available for, for everybody. I bring my own, but um, they would have made them available. And that's normally a conversation starter. So people are like, oh, why do you have this badge? And then I can explain, you know, why I have it. And then depending on the mood, I might not always say it's a mess. Sometimes I might just say it's because I have a health condition, because I have a chronic illness. There's a whole range of kind of replies. Um, I can kind of use in a way and it would depend on the situation. But uh, one thing I found is once you actually open up about something like this, people normally have something similar to kind of share back and they feel more likely to share that with you as well, actually. Yeah, I guess everyone has a story and, and talking about it makes makes all these stories more, um, makes it easier for people to share their own story and, and makes it less of an exception and more of, of just a different uh, a different story, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Just about normalizing it. Just the way people maybe talk about their children, you know, why not talk about something like that? So um, I absolutely agree. And I just wanted to say thank you um, for sharing. My best friend has MS, so I know some of the challenges um, and I just really enjoyed your talk. But I, uh, I wanted to ask, um, because I have, I have those days too, where like the bad days where I need just a day off or I need to, to take rest. Um, and is there anything you do um, to prepare for those? Or, you know, do you build in some extra time for the days when your symptoms are flaring? Or do you talk to your supervisors in advance or anything like that just to, to prepare for those days? Yeah, so I have to say my, my current manager is amazing. So if I were, so obviously at the moment I'm working from home anyway, but even if there were a day, I would just email in saying, look, I'm not, I'm not functioning today. I do what I can. And she's normally like, yeah, that's fine. And the understanding is I'm, I'm not make the, up those hours in a way, but I, you know, but obviously you do, you know, and you would kind of make sure you do stay on top of like your deadlines and things like that. So she's been really, really great, which one of, that's one of the things I didn't really have um, before. Um, the other thing I have, and I, I recommend people do that is a um, off day to do list. So basically I have like a little checklist. So some of the things on that to do list would be maybe make it to the sofa you know, you know, you know, make a cup of tea, like little things, you know, think about having a bath, like just things that you could do that you can kind of feel like you've done something positive, but that's not work or that's not. And it's just, um, so I do like, and that's, um, it's kind of the, at the end of the day, being able to say like, yes, I've achieved something, however small, you know, this is where they don't compare, not even yourself to others, but don't compare good days and bad days. You know, just know that this was a bad day and you did the best you could. And, you know, and even if you only ticked one thing off of your list, then you at least have that one kind of tick. Jean Holloway, and she will talk about how to overcome anxiety. Perfect. Um, yeah, so as uh, Eleanor said, I'm Jean Holloway. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today and share my experience. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and as other people have said too, this is just my personal experience with anxiety. I'm not a psychologist. Um, this is, yeah, my lived experience, um, trying to navigate my academic career while having anxiety. 
um, I went from barely functioning <laughs> um, to seeking treatment and making some changes in my lifestyle um, over the past couple of years. And I've really found success through that. So um, I'm now, you know, feeling grounded, I'm feeling happy, um, and I'm achieving at a higher level than ever. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, today I'm just going to share a few of the tips that I found um, to get me from, from that, that sort of state to um, where I'm at today. Um, and if, if you want some more information on anything that I'm discussing, um, I, I think Eleanor mentioned at the beginning that I wrote a blog uh, for the EGU Cryospheric Sciences um, blog series. Um, so there's lots more details in there. Um, yeah, so this is, these are some feelings um, that are associated with some mental health. And, you know, this is stuff that I was feeling on a daily basis and all at once. Um, and, and, you know, I still do to some extent. Um, but the feeling that jumps out for me is overwhelmed. That's the one that stands out for you the most. Um, so simply anxiety is the body's natural response to stress. Um, and it's, you know, feelings of fear, worry, nervousness. Um, yeah, so like it's, um, it's a natural, natural thing to some extent to have some anxiety, um, but it becomes problematic when it's debilitating. Um, so for me, when things get really bad, you know, I'm paralyzed, I can't get out of bed, um, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's, when, that's when it starts to become a problem if it's affecting your life. Uh, for me, some of my symptoms uh, include, you know, restlessness. Um, you can't see my feet right now, but I'm tapping my foot against the chair. Um, I play with my hair a lot. I need to move around, um, that kind of stuff. Um, I call it the sense of impending doom. Um, but it's this feeling of, you know, constant panic or fear, um, danger, sort of always being in that flight, fight or flight mode. Um, two big ones for me are trouble concentrating and trouble sleeping. Um, and, and obsessive, worrying, obsessive thoughts, racing thoughts. Um, so when, yeah, when things are getting really bad um, and I am waking up at night, I, you know, I know I sort of need to make some changes or that my anxiety is getting really bad. Um, and I've gone through through phases, um, especially during, let's say, my comprehensive exams during my PhD, uh, when I was having panic attacks because it was it was getting quite bad. And you know that's associated with some physical symptoms like um, increased heart rate and and rapid breathing and stuff. And um, yeah, so that doesn't happen very often and, and hasn't hasn't for years now. But um, it can get can get bad like that. And then, yeah, that was just my, my symptoms, but there are, there are many others as well. And if you're feeling any of these, um, maybe you have uh, some anxiety. Um, and then I wanted just to touch on some academia specific triggers um, for me. So the first one being um, this sort of pressure to achieve at a high level. And that can come from all directions, um, but a lot of the time it's pressure that I put on myself. So one recent example of, of this and how it triggered my anxiety is um, I got an email from someone who read um, a paper that I recently published and they just sort of mentioned in their email that I'd cited their paper incorrectly on my reference list. And that triggered, you know, my perfectionism. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was obsessing about this forever, um, for days. And you know, I wasn't eating. I, yeah, anyways, it was just a huge overreaction to this sort of like very minor mistake that I'd made. Um, and, you know, thankfully now I have the tools that I, you know, I caught myself in that moment and I was able to sort of get my feet back on the ground. Um, but that, that kind of stuff, like those triggers are, are happening all the time. Um, and, you know, I think, I think in academia, um, there is a lot of pressure to achieve at a high level. And I think a lot of the stuff that Anne talked about in her talk about imposter syndrome and stuff that I feel as well. Um, there are lots of deadlines and I think there um, are often sort of unreal unrealistic expectations of what we can achieve in, in those deadlines. Um, competitive work environments, um, even toxic work environments. I'm a graduate student and so things are, uh, can be competitive um, and it's hard not to compare yourself to others. Um, lack of support. So, um, again, I'm a graduate student um, and often we're left to our own devices, um, but I think 
um, for early career researchers as well, if you get a tenure track faculty position, um, you're kind of you're kind of sort of like okay, go go set up your research program. Um, and I think I think it is one of the most stressful times. Um, and yeah, we're sort of on our own. And I wanted just to touch on um, networking and conferences quickly. I I can't possibly be the only introverted academic, um, and I find conferences just terrible. Um, there's a lot of good things that come out of them, but I am just anxious the whole time. Um, you know, people are people always say, "Oh, conferences are fun. Just go network. It'll be great." Um, and I'm I am just terrified the whole time. So you know, those are all things that I think a lot of us experience that, that can be anxiety inducing. Um, what I really wanted to talk about today was uh, what I have done um, in my life, these lifestyle changes that I've made um, that have been really helpful for me to be successful in ta tackling my anxiety. Um, the first one is to get help. And I can't emphasize this one enough. Um, just finding someone that you can talk to. Uh, for me, that meant seeking professional help. Um, so I regularly see a private counselor um, and you know that isn't it doesn't always have to be the route you take but um it's been really really helpful for me and there's lots of options for that especially right now um there's online options and there's in my at my university there's um free counseling services so there there are many options um another big one for me has been to limit stress um where i can so i've cut down tremendously on what i'm involved in and I say no to a lot of things. Um, and I even turn down opportunities that are probably beneficial to my career, uh, just because my stress management is more important. Um, I won't have a career if I burn out. So I, try, I really try to stay on top of that. Um, I try and work regular sort of nine to five hours. Sometimes it's 10 to four. <laughs> um, and that might mean that I work at a slower pace than what uh, is typically you know, viewed as an academic. Um, and that's just because my mental health is more important. Um, and I just need to do that because it's necessary for me. And guess what? Um, no one has noticed, you know, this, I thought everyone was gonna be like, oh, Jean's, you know, not working as hard as she used to. And that's not the case. Um, and in fact, I'm actually achieving at a higher level now than I was before when I was, you know, burning myself out. Yeah, th there's other, simple lifestyle changes that I've made um, that have been really beneficial. And I'd say that sleep is the biggest one for me. Um, regular sleep is, has been shown, like studies show that it's key for good mental health. Um, and so I try to go to sleep at the same time each night. Um, and I wake, uh, I wake up at the same time. And this includes on the weekends uh, for the most part. Um, a healthy diet and exercise. So exercise has been mentioned quite a few times already. Um, and I find those things are super beneficial and especially limiting alcohol and drug intake. That's been a, a very important thing for me. Um, and, you know, I try to do things like, especially now with the coronavirus, I try to do yoga and go for a walk outside to give my brain a break. You know, if I'm staring at the computer all day, um, I find my anxiety goes up. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I've been running and just trying to get outside. It's very helpful. Um, a couple other things I do are I do daily meditation and journaling. Um, I find when things uh, at work get busy and overwhelming, these, having these practices um, help keep my stress and negative thoughts uh, at bay. So there's lots of um, guided meditation apps that you can get, um, and even starting with two minutes is, is great. Um, it's challenging, especially at first. It's a practice, right? So you, it's, it's something that you, you build your skills in. And it is, it is challenging, especially, you know, I have racing thoughts and it's hard to get through a meditation without, you know, going off into la-la land. Um, but it's practice and it gets easier over time. Um, and then the last couple of things, the so work-life balance is something, it's a term that's thrown around a lot, but um, I find it's extremely important uh, for positive mental health outcomes for me. Um, so yeah, have fun, get a hobby. Um, I think being well-rounded has um, made me more resilient um, when things get stressful. If you feel like there's no time for fun or hobbies or rest, there's a problem in, in that equation. Um, and then the last thing is if you're feeling overwhelmed and you need a break, take a break. Um, you know, even if it's a short break, but uh, 
there's no no shame in taking some time off. Um, I took a month off, uh, sort of in the middle of my PhD because my mental health was tanking. And I think that was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. Um, because if I hadn't taken that that break to recover, I don't think that I, I would be where I am at right now. And the final thing that I wanted to leave everybody with is that there is hope. Um, you know, it sometimes feels like it feels like it's not going to be okay. And you know, there was a point in my life where I didn't, I didn't think that I could be where I am at today. Um, and if I overcame all this stuff, you can too. So, uh, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Jean, for this really inspiring talk and inspiring message. Um, is there anyone who has a question or comment for Jean? Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, with the, the get help part, it's like how, how did you know kind of when to get help and why did you decide that you needed professional help? Because I've been kind of, that's been one of the things for me, it's been just really tricky to like when, or now I'm getting better at it because I'm kind of learning, but I, at the start, it's like I said already, it's like, I just felt like I wasn't ill enough to get help. So I was just wondering how you like, how you decided when to get help and kind of what level of help. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually advocate for the fact that I think everyone should be doing some kind of counseling because I find it it's so helpful. Um, I waited till it was too late. So um, I, I started um, seeing a counselor after my comprehensive exams. I mentioned that I had sort of panic attacks and stuff um, and things got quite, quite bad, uh, sort of acute anxiety. Um, I also suffer from some other mental health issues and trauma. So um, it kind of all like culminated in this big storm. I mean, I definitely waited till it was too late. I think, I think, um, I think there's a lot available for people and we often need an outsider's perspective to help us sort of untangle the, the mess that's going on in our brain. So I think if you're experiencing any kind of you know, m mild or moderate anxiety, like worrying about even like a specific event, it's worth, it's worth checking in with somebody. Um, so I, I wouldn't wait as long as I did if I could go back. <laughs> I was wondering like if there's people listening um, to this and they recognize a lot of the symptoms that you explained um, and they feel like they would like to get help, um, but they don't really know where to start. I can imagine this step to go to a counselor is really big. So what would you recommend them to do as a very first step? Like, okay, I, I realize I need help. Where, where should I go first? Hmm, um, I mean, there's, t there's a ton of resources online. Um, so yeah, reading, even reading about people's experiences are really helpful because you can relate. Um, and I found that was really good for me. I have a lot of friends that I'm really open with. And so it, for me, it was talking with friends that sort of made me realize that, um, you know, I'm not alone in this. And yeah, like it's sort of validating those feelings. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, cause I agree. It is kind of a big uh, scary thing to like go see a counselor. Um, and it might be like a, a hurdle that's a bit too big for people to jump over, but um, I would say, yeah, like open up to someone that you're close with, if that's a friend or, you know, your parents or siblings or something like that, um, or even like a work colleague, anybody that uh, can relate. Um, and then, and then, you know, there's available, it's called Talkspace, um, but you can do some sort of virtual counseling if, if like going to see somebody is too much. Um, there's a lot of different options nowadays with all the sort of technology that's coming out. So you can, you know, text with somebody if that's like a little bit less daunting, that kind of, that kind of stuff is available. So there's, there's so many resources out there. Um, there's also like, I mean, I'm happy to talk with anybody. Uh, the blog that I wrote, my emails at the bottom. Um, so like if, if someone is having symptoms and they just want to want to talk about it, I'm, I'm totally open to that too. So may, may I jump on that, Eleanor? Sure. So I was thinking uh, about what Stephanie asked, what Steph asked. I don't think there is a minimum amount of sick you need to do be or a minimum amount of anxiety you need to have before you're allowed to get help. Um, if you feel you need it, then you probably do. Uh, and you can probably benefit, as Jean says. Um, 
And I think also maybe where to start depends potentially on the local systems. Um, in the Netherlands, pretty much any kind of care, care always starts with the GP and you probably know your GP, so then that's a bit less daunting perhaps. Um, then uh, going online and just, uh, you know, starting from, from scratch. Thanks for that. Um, we're going to move on to the final talk, which will be by Yuri Tiding, and he's going to talk about the research perspective on this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen. My name is Yuri Tiding. I'm a, um, a assistant professor and a, re and a psychiatrist um, here at the in Amsterdam. Um, um, at the Amsterdam UMC, I do my research and I work as a psychiatrist in, uh, in Amsterdam. And I am, um, I'm very much interested in mental health in academia specifically, not only because of my role in, uh, as, a, as a psychiatrist, but also because I study researchers. This is my, the main topic. I, my, I did my PhD uh, on research integrity and, and the, my PhD was called research, uh, Publish and Perish. Uh, research on research and researchers um, and I also wrote a small uh, self-help guide uh, called uh, scientists on the sofa how to survive in academia so I'm very interested in in in, in well let's say the suffering in science and and uh, how how do we suffer in academia and how can we improve it I mean there are so many different ways but the, re the, the, the fact is is that we suffer and if we go zoom into the dates uh, some 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 cohort studies done among PhD students, but also on med biomedical professors. You have a 33% burnout rate among PhD students in um, in Amsterdam. In the Flemish cohort of PhD students, 30% is at high risk of developing a psychiatric disorder, um, and that's 2.4 times more often than in the uh, the uh, in the comparative sample with highly educated people in, in, in Flanders. Uh, there is, uh, interestingly, uh, the, those uh, depressive symptoms are related to a, a, a more harshly relationship with, their, with, with supervisors. So probably there's a relationship with, with this, the, 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 the quality of the supervisor and the, and the, the, the depressive symptoms. And interestingly, not only PhD students suffer, I, I think whole academia suffered because the, uh, we did a survey among biomedical professors and 25, almost 25% have severe symptoms of burnout. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is quite, uh, these numbers are quite high. So there is suffering. The question is, why do we suffer? What we in, in, in our research always tell is there are three different global pillars of, of, of suffering. One is the individual fact, the contributions to suffering. One is the individual factors, and then you can think of neuroticism, or then you can think of personality uh, 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 that, that may be more vulnerable to these things. But you have two other very important aspects in academia and that's one is the systemic pillar and then you can think of publication pressure or you can think of this very unidimensional uh, um, uh, uh, assessment criteria that we have and you have also have these uh, cultural aspects they're also very important this is about unwritten rules about moral beliefs about a supervisor relationship within your department and they 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 all contribute to uh, mental health in academia um, and there are several other uh, things that I want to highlight here. There's an extreme hyper competitive uh, uh, atmosphere in academia. If you look at the academic pyramid, you have, uh, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, 80% uh, of people that are doing a PhD will not end up in academia. Only 20% 20, 20 will have a chance of getting a postdoc position, which is fairly low. We, we, we do educate a lot of PhD students, but at, and the, at the end of their PhD, there's not a lot of space for, for, for getting a career in, in science. There are, the, as I told the assessment career, that are only focused on, public, on numbers of publication and on citations, and not so much on very important academic duties, such as education, such as mentorship, such as um, uh, 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 outreach, public outreach, and, and there are so many more uh, uh, um, important academic duties. And one other thing that I really like to highlight is that we are 
it is never done. It's never finished. You can work endlessly. You can work day and night and this academic work is never done. So you have to protect yourself. And that's so difficult because we want to do good. We really want to perform as, um, as researchers. And the same goes for me. Of course, I want to be, this, I'm now an assistant professor and maybe I want to more and I want to show the world that I'm a good researcher because I'm also, uh, of course, I'm also insecure whether I, I am actually a good researcher or not. Um, so it's logical that because of the burden, because of so many tasks we have, we work a lot. If we look at, uh, in another research, what we did, we looked at uh, mi misbehaviors, and there you see one of the, the most impactful misbehaviors, and we replicated this finding in another, uh, in another cohort, uh, the most important and impactful research misbehavior is, as, as one of the things that I want to highlight here, is insufficient, if insufficient supervision or mentoring of, of early career researchers. And this, is, this will come back continuously. So it is so important that we, as early career researchers, we have a task, but also for, as supervisor, we have an important task to, um, to show, the, to do the, the good thing as a, as a, or supervisor or as a PhD student. So the University of Maastricht ha has developed a great way how we can improve supervision. And they developed two, 10 golden rules for PhD candidates and 10 golden rules for uh, supervisors. And they are he very helpful in, in getting the work done in a, in a joyous and in an uh, optimistic uh, uh, way. And one of the key things here is is and this is well we see that often also in interviews that we do with researchers is we do not talk about expectations the expectations of a phd or the expectations or the supervisor uh, we do not give a room as supervisor i'm also a supervisor we do not give enough room for the phds to, to become the captain of their own ship of the captain of their own project um, we have to make sure that they manage their time well. We have to encourage them to take off, to don't work in the weekend. Don't show them to, to work, that, you all, that sometimes you work in the weekend if you want to work in the weekend. Um, share your network as a supervisor or um, um, uh, ask for what you need as a PhD student. I mean, they're so, it, it, these 10 golden rules are really helpful for young of a young, uh, young early career researchers, but also for supervisors, because the, that's the next slide. These 10 tips for uh, supervisors are really helpful as well, because uh, having a good relationship with your supervisor really can make or break your PhD trajectory. I mean, it is, is it, I, I always compare it being a parent. You, you are, in a way, you are a parent for your PhD student, not in, in terms of, uh, not in terms of really giving them, you don't have to raise them as a, as a person, but you do have to raise them as a researcher. And I really, that's why I like the analogy so much because uh, you have to be very, um, um, very conscious about this specific role as a supervisor uh, because you are the example and PhD students look up to you and see what you do and they copy your behavior which is like very normal behavior but we have to be very conscious about this so please have a look at this i think the slides are all will, will be available and have a look at these this wonderful study done in from maastricht university and then finally because i think i'm already running out of time uh, some some tips from from my book how to survive in academia I just want to highlight two that I think are very important uh, for, um, um, for uh, that will soften your, 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 uh, your, your feelings about academia a bit, but also can let you rediscover the beauty of academia because we're not in academia without any reason, because it's a beautiful way to deal with the truth to be be part of uh of knowledge production to be uh, uh to be uh, to be of value for society there are so many good reasons it's a beautiful method i mean it's it's beautiful but on the other hand we should not uh, we should de-romanticize academia a bit as well and that that's not about this knowledge but that's but that's about the positions that are i mean being a professor um i'm not a professor but 
I see a lot of suffering among professors as well. I mean, you're, you, you work constantly. You, you, uh, there's hardly any time. You, you have to be available all the time. You have so many different tasks, which is, on the one hand, is daunting and ambitious, but on the other hand, it can be a big burden as well. That's one thing that I want to highlight. And the other thing, what I always really like, um, well, of course, I really like that we, ex that we have to accept that we tend nonsensical to each other. I mean, there's so many things that we say during the day at conferences or in talks that, that people just forget. I, this was one realization when I, I flew back from a conference in Hong Kong um, and I so sat in the plane and I realized so I invest so much time and money in this conference. And what did I actually learn? What really stayed with me? And that was some networking maybe, and maybe one talk that really was inspirational. But the knowledge that I really took from the conference was quite, uh, it was not much. And it, this is not a bad thing, but we have to realize that not everything what we talk is, we should not take everything what we say too serious. But the last thing that I want, would really like to highlight is embrace the role of coincidence and luck. And this is a, a two-sided uh, coin here because uh, we will get rejections all the time. This is part of academic life. We, have to, we are suffering a little bit because we get rejected all the time, not only papers, but also in grant proposals. Uh, it's part of academic life, but we have to be honest about it. If you get uh, if you get rejected, it is not a personal rejection. It's not that your research is bad or that the quality of your proposal is not good. I think we should, because the, the rates are five to 10%. I mean, it's just, we have bad luck. And the same goes, we have to, uh, we have to send the same message to the people who are lucky that you get this, the money. We are just lucky. It's not that your proposal is so much better in quality. I be don't believe that. It's just we are lucky that we ha had this money and that we get these chances. And it's a better message for yourself to be modest, to, to stay modest, but also to the people that didn't receive the grant, that they were just not lucky instead of that they were not good enough. Um, so these are just some advices uh, that come out of the book. I'm currently working with my with the publisher with an with an um, uh, a translation that and if you want to become a like a early early re a reviewer of the of the book because we're currently translating it and we need some comments on it in, at the translation so send me a message and maybe we can work it out or if you're just interested in the book send me a message to this email address um, and um, and uh, and I'm al always happy to answer your questions. Uh, are there any questions for now? Thanks a lot. Um, I read the book and it's really, uh, it's short, so you can read it very quickly, but it has a lot of very practical pieces of advice on how, uh, how to survive literally in, in academia. Um, yeah, like Yuri said, is anyone, has anyone a question or a comment? We don't have a lot of time left, but uh, I'm sure we have some time. Chris Jackson here. And a hugely inspirational talk, Yuri. Um, really great. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like the, the, this idea that we try to survive in academia. I think the idea that we are surviving is probably that word in itself tells you a lot. And thrive would, you know, it's a cliche, but let's use it. If we're, if we're here to survive, that's not much, right? That's not much of an existence. Let's be all, like, just be honest with ourselves. And so the survivors, I mean, even the people who survive, what, what does that tell you? I mean, so I would, I, I would try, you know, I always try and scrap that word because I always think of like, having your own experience in academia. And then if you actually calibrate it back to your personal aims, then it's, um, you, can, you can get fulfillment with a numerically lower amount of achievements than the person next door. And this goes back to Anna's point about the metrics. What do they measure? I'm a harsh critic of metrics, so I could talk forever about this, but like, what do those things actually measure about what we need academia to do to work? And Yori, you touched on this, you know, we need people to, to, to supervise correctly, to engage with people, to do outreach, do all of these other things that make academia work. It's not simply publishing papers in nature, right? That doesn't make academia work. So I don't know what your views are about that, like how we could, like, if we are to measure things, what would we be trying to measure in your experience of talking to academics, Yuri? 
Yeah, so so we we also did some research on 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 responsible assessment criteria, and and, and we talk with a lot of researchers about this, and and it constantly what they say, well, we don't like these metrics. No one likes those metrics because it's except for the the gen, uh, ge, uh, the, the the small uh, portion of ge, uh, genetic researchers that publish constantly in Nature, um, <laughs> but no one likes them because it's not fair. It's never fair be to, because it's incomparable. You cannot compare researchers one with another. So what they say is, please uh, do a 360 feedback round in your yearly assessment. And take that into account. In uh, so make it a multi-dimensional approach. Uh, give good ratings to supervision, for example. G give uh, what about your ratings uh, of your your the the, the teaching you do? Uh, what about if for doctors then? What about your clinical uh, uh, duties? Uh, this, this doesn't apply to you. But what about the the public outreach? I mean, this is also a very important aspect of your of your life. Or what about having extracurricular activities such as um, writing blogs. I mean, why don't we should, we should value blogs because they can be so much more impactful than, than to be honest, to be some papers, or even my papers, some papers are just, I'm, I, 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 I would be grateful if 10 people have read them. I mean, uh, which is, while in a blog you can reach out to thousands faster, it's shorter and maybe you can have more impact. So. So it's it, we have to go, we should go to a multi-dimensional approach. That's for sure, and and we're changing it. You can look at the Hong Kong Manifesto, for example. We will give we we'll give a, a, a better view to more honest assessment criteria, and we should move away from the Hirsch index and the impact factors. Thank you very much. Yeah, we should really really try to find a new definition of success because it's really focused on the publication yeah. part, and and like you said, outreach, teaching, uh, supervision. That's also important and it's not really, it's getting a bit more included in some institutions. They try to look at it, but still, I feel like the basis is still very focused on these publication numbers and H index. Yeah. But let's hope we can contribute a bit to that by, uh, by having this webinar. Yeah, that's it. So um, uh, if you have any questions or comments, like I said, you can uh, type them in the comment section below and we will try to get back to you. Thank you. <laughs>